Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service here today. And welcome to those who are watching from home, and that includes Abby, who says she's watching from Dreek, Dorset. I don't know if the weather's much better here just now. Good morning, too, to Richard and Thomas, um, Margaret Mullen, Elizabeth Taylor, Nora. Um, these are the names that of Colin Turner has also and joined us. Good, and so good morning to them and to you as we gather as God's people to worship him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Um, later in the service we'll be hearing a little bit about Christian Aid Week and there are some, if you haven't already had a leaflet and, a, and a, an envelope, um, we've, I've left some out at the front which you can uplift at the end and um, these can be returned any time over the next four Sundays if you wish. Um, as we gather as God's people to worship him, we begin with some words um, that are on our sheet um, from, Psalm th from Psalm 3 that we say together. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be upon your people. And as we gather to worship, we use the words of the first hymn. Um, though we're not allowed to sing, um, I suppose we can clap or even hum. Um, but we'll start by reading the first um, two verses. It was down at the feet of Jesus, oh, the happy, happy day, that my soul found peace in believing, and my sins were washed away. Let me tell the old, old story of his grace so full and free, for I feel like giving him the glory for his wondrous love to me. It was down at the feet of Jesus where I found such perfect rest, where the light first dawned on my spirit and my soul was truly blessed. Let me tell the old, old story of his grace so full and free, for I feel like giving him the glory for his wondrous love to me. Ina will play the music for us.
Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your wonderful love and for all the goodness that you have shown to us. We thank you, Lord, that once again we can come into your presence to experience your love, your blessings, to enjoy fellowship with you. We give thanks, most gracious God, for the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. We give thanks that he gave himself up for us on Calvary's cross, that he shed his precious blood for us sinners that we might be brought back to you. Loving God, we love him who first loved us. We give you glory and praise for your beautiful, lovely Son, our glorious Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, we humbly ask for your blessing upon us, we who are gathered here today, and upon those who watch from afar at home. Grant that all of us may be drawn closer to yourself and into the things of your love and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do ask for your blessings upon all your faithful people at this time. Lord, we acknowledge that so often we have fallen short of the standards of your goodness and love. And yet you have shown us your mercies and your grace. So we humbly seek your pardon, Lord. May it be, Lord, that even as we hear your word today, and as your word is heard in different places and at different times, that people will turn to you and experience you and your love and your goodness and your mercy. Teach us your ways, Lord. Lead us in the way of your commandments, for your laws are good and your statutes are perfect and pure, converting the heart. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to come together to glorify you and sing, hear your praises, to worship you, to hear your word, to celebrate your goodness, to remember all that you have done for us. So we pray for your blessing upon us today. And we ask it all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to his glory. Amen. And one of the, I just noticed the, a name that came up on the screen that Muriel Bazini, who's watching as far away as Quebec, Quebec and Canada, um, and another one that's just come up is Alistair, Alistair Bowie. So good to have these people um, joining us as we worship together. Now we're going to hear a little bit about Christian Aid Week and Arthur's going to read or to share something on that and, and then read the gospel passage. Christian Aid Week 2021, which begins tomorrow, features the true story of Florence Musliani from Pituli, an arid region in Kenya. She says she is a person who lives happily and likes singing. If anyone disappoints her, she just walks away and starts singing. She married when still young. She and her husband had four children. She became widowed. Life was hard, with a six-hour daily trek to fetch water for cooking and washing. Eventually, Christian A helped her village to build a dam. 
This enabled a decent supply of water nearby. This has proved vital to the new community garden, where Florence and others can grow crops. She also keeps chickens, livestock and a bee farm. Florence is aware that God has provided for her. She says that she often prays for peace for her children and for rain. We learn also of Rose Katanu Jonathan, who, as Florence once did, has a hard six-hour daily walk to collect water which she needs for her grandchildren. Rose is an older woman. She can remember the time when the climatic patterns were more predictable and the rainfall could be relied upon to produce a good crop of fruit. Now, although nearby there is an earth dam, it empties fast. However, with adequate supplies of cement, her community and communities like hers could build more dams, and with supplies of the right sort of seeds, they could sow crops that can thrive with a little water. Rose says God gives her strength and helps her persevere. She prays that God will enable and inspire people to help communities like hers. For more than 75 years, Christian Aid has provided humanitarian relief and long-term development support for poor communities worldwide, highlighting suffering and tackling injustice and championing people's rights. Christian Aid is the official relief, development and advocacy agency of 41 churches in Britain and Ireland. These include the Church of Scotland, the Scottish Episcopal Church, the Salvation Army, the United Free Church of Scotland, the Baptist Union and the Methodist Church. We now turn to our Gospel reading this morning which is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 28, and commencing to read at verse 16. That's Matthew 28, verse 16. The eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, even though some of them doubted. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Thank you, Arthur, for sharing those things with us. And we turn to the second hymn. And again, let's read. The first two verses. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect communion, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. My story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, 
This is my soul, praising my Saviour all the day long. As we reflect upon God's word today, let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, we come before you. We thank you for your goodness to us and your love. We pray that you, your spirit would guide and strengthen us as we share from your word today. Guide and help us and help us to draw closer to you and know more of Christian experience of what you can do for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage that we read from the Bible is one of the great passages of the New Testament that clearly describes God as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The word trinity means three. God who is the threefold God, he's one God, and yet he's three because he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's one of the great truths revealed in the Bible, hinted at in the Old Testament, shown more fully in the New God is one, yet he exists as in three persons, three centres of being, of personality. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each of these is God. None is entirely separate from the others. It's far more than God simply functioning in three different ways. Rather, there are three facets of his being, three centres of personality. They are Jesus, who is, for example, Jesus is both man and God. The Holy Spirit is God as well. In a sense, how that can be is beyond our capacity to understand fully. It's one of the, what we call the mysteries of faith. So we shouldn't be too concerned if we can't fully explain it. It reminds me of the story of the school teacher who once asked the class, who can tell me the explanation of how electricity works? A small boy put his hand up. Yes, Jimmy, said the teacher. And there was a, a, a hesitation. The wee boy said, oh, oh, I forgot. That's a pity, the teacher said, 
because nobody has ever found the full explanation of why electricity works. It's a pity that you forgot it. And perhaps we would say, or could say the same, about explaining how God is a trinity. Down the ages, Christians have found it difficult to to explain this. They've poured long and hard over this problem, written articles and many books, long books about it. But as we read the New Testament, it makes perfect sense to read it this way, to understand it this way. And the New Testament doesn't really set out to prove that God is Trinity. It almost assumes that he is. It makes perfect sense when we read it in that way. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are all persons. They're not things, they're not forces, they're not simply activities. So, for example, the Spirit of God is he and not just it. The Spirit of God is spoken of has been personal terms in the Bible. And so the, we read that the Holy Spirit speaks and directs. The Holy Spirit told the Christians, the church in Antioch, separate from, from me Barnabas and Saul to the work that have called them to do. The Holy Spirit leads. The Bible says that all who are led by the Spirit are called the children of God. The Holy Spirit teaches. He brings things to our remembrance. He bears witness to Jesus. He's a person, not just it, not just a, a force. And as a person, he has feelings. The Holy Spirit can be saddened. He can be grieved. Paul says, do not quench the Spirit, do not grieve the Spirit, don't stand in his way. And so that means, I suppose, if we're conscious of God's Spirit starting to move in our hearts, then we shouldn't stop him. We shouldn't stop him in his tracks. He comes to dwell within us. We can be filled with the Spirit. The Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. We can be filled with the Spirit and first emptied of our own selfish desires, our self-centeredness. Be filled with the Spirit as a way of life. Live that way. Live each day seeking God, desiring Him, opening yourself to His power and goodness and mercy. That's how we should live. The Spirit who acts closely with the Father and with the Son who helps to build the church. The church is one foundation. is Jesus. The church is built on Jesus and all that he did. He fulfilled God's covenant and God's purpose. He is, in a sense, the new Israel of God. And God's purposes are fulfilled in Jesus. And then we're drawn into Jesus ourselves. The Spirit draws us into the people of God. He, just as Jesus himself gathers us up and unites us to himself. We're drawn by the Spirit and gathered up into Christ, into that relationship, into that family relationship, into that covenant relationship where God wills to be our Father and makes us and calls us his children. But more than that, we see how there's a task given to us, an authority given to us. Here, Jesus says, all power and authority are given unto me. And that's important because here this passage takes place at the end of the gospel, at the end of the passage that's been about the resurrection. The disciples have come to see and experience the risen Lord, the most wonderful news that Jesus is alive. No longer is he buried in the ground. Jesus bodily and in his full being had risen. We're dealing with a risen Savior, a living Lord. And he grants to the church the task, the privilege of continuing his work, of bringing people into fellowship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This passage is sometimes called the Great Commission. 
And just as Jesus says, all power and authority is given unto me, so he gives his church an authority. It's called the Great Commission. We sometimes speak of a commission as someone like a, someone in the Navy or the Army. They might get a commission, an appointment to an officer rank. Traditionally, historically, these commissions were handed out in the name of the monarch. They conferred a responsibility and an authority to carry out this, the policy and instructions of the state or of the king or of the queen. Similarly, the church receives its instructions, its commission, its authority from Christ, our King. And with that commission, we are to take the message of Jesus out to the world to help people observe them and teach them the same commandments that we ourselves are called to follow. In a sense, that is the central task of the church, to tell people about Jesus, to make new disciples. If a church doesn't see that as important, well, it's barely a church at all. And so it lays on us an obligation as a church and as individuals. It's not enough to say, I'm a Christian and just leave it like that. Our faith should be part of the life that is displayed to the world. It's not that we're trying to show off, but we don't want, we're not trying to hide our faith either. It shouldn't be a secret that we're Christians. People should be able to observe it by our actions, by our lifestyle, by our words. There have been, there's so many lost opportunities when we've not been keen to speak the gospel. We should be happy to let people know that we're Christ's followers and we should let them know that we would like them to be as well. Because it, and it all flows from what we believe. Because we believe that Christ died on the cross for full salvation. His, dealt, his death has dealt with sin, the problem of sin. As a sign, yes, that God took sin seriously, but Jesus rose again as a sign that that had been dealt with. The task was finished. And we believe in Jesus as such. We receive him for salvation. We come to see ourselves as his. We belong to Jesus. And because of that, we've signed away our right to a self-determined life. We've placed ourselves in, hand, in his hands and we take on his task, his commandments. The great Sc Scottish Christian writer James Denny once put it this way, the new life springs out of the sense of debt to Christ. We, we know what Jesus did for us. He died on the cross for our sins. He set us free through Calvary's cross. And faith in him places on us a responsibility, the burden, the burden of the gospel. Jesus said to his disciples that they were to go out into the uttermost places of the world. Well, the uttermost places of the world, that can just be where we are here, our villages and communities. I came across a, a document which was written in the 15th century, before the Reformation, and it, it was a document from, that was sent to Rome and it described Argyle and the Isles and Iona as the furthermost place or the ends of the habitable world. In a sense, that describes the mission field that was then. It's the mission field for us here today. For people today need Jesus just as much as ever and just as much as we do. We are to be missionaries of the cross where we are. We owe it to the world. We owe it to our neighbours not to keep our faith concealed, but rather to let to show whom we serve and to whom we belong. Perhaps we might think, well, the church is small and the society is uninterested. People are going different ways 
They have different interests. In some, some ways, they're even opposed to the gospel. And yet, Jesus said, All power and authority are given unto me. And he says, Go out. And that tells me, perhaps it tells you, that by his power and authority, the truth can speak into people's hearts. God's Spirit can move in people's hearts, can prompt people, can disturb people, can, in a sense, the, the message of Jesus can cut through the darkness of the world, can impact on the lives of even hardened people. Remember what the Lord said to Joshua as he entered the land of Canaan, be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid, for the Lord your God is with you. And as you observe the commandments, you will prosper in what you do. And maybe that's a word for us today, that if we take these commandments seriously and go out into the world, then God says it will not be in vain. It may start with something very small, perhaps even with people seeing the tribe praying banner and taking a try praying leaflet that's out there. And we're assured of God's presence in the church as we remain faithful to the Great Commission, as we seek to let people hear of a Saviour who is all-sufficient, who can meet their needs, who meets our needs. We remember that Jesus paid the price for us that we might be forgiven at Calvary, that we might know the blessings of friendship with God, all the blessings of Christian life and experience. And we can get it too as we turn our lives over to Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to renew and fill us and come into our lives. We remember, you remember that there's one way of salvation, and that's Jesus himself. And we too can have a fresh experience of his love and of the power of the Spirit. Perhaps there's something that he wants to do in our lives, to deal with, to turn around, to sort out. Allow him to do it. Tell him that you are glad that he's making you a new person, that you want to serve him better. And know that as you do so, he is with you that you'll hear and honour your prayers. Amen and thanks be to God for this preaching on his holy word and to him be all glory and praise. We're going to read again, which we've done before, but words from Romans. And after that, I'll um, put on my face shield my, um, so that I can sing a solo. Um, um, but first we, um, before, as it were, the, sing the anthem, we'll, um, I'll, we'll read those words from Romans 8. We don't always know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us. God chose us, his people, in advance. God chose us to become like Jesus. Having chosen us, he called us to come to him, giving us a right standing. He gave us his glory. Precious, precious blood of Jesus Shed on Calvary Shed for rebels, shed for sinners Shed for thee Precious, precious blood of Jesus Ever flowing free O oh, believe it, O oh, receive it, tis for thee. 
precious, precious blood of Jesus, let it make thee whole. Let it flow in mighty cleansing o'er thy soul. Precious, precious blood of Jesus, ever flowing free. O oh, believe it, O oh, receive it, tis for thee. Precious blood, by this we conquer in the fiercest fight. Sin and Satan overcoming by its might. Precious, precious blood of Jesus, ever flowing free. Oh, believe it, oh, receive it, tis for thee. Now we continue in prayer once again. Loving God, our Heavenly Father, how we give you thanks that once again we're able to come and hear the message of the Saviour's love. We thank you that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and the way back to you. We thank you that we receive in him and through him the assurance of your mercy and the blessings of a new life of sin forgiven and peace with you especially in these difficult times in the world we thank you that we're able to gather together as your people and worship you and remember that you are in our midst and that you come to dwell with your people your spirit is here amongst us your ear is open to our pr prayers you hear our cries we thank you for all the blessings that the Holy Spirit brings us as he draws us into Christian life and experience. Lord, we think of our troubled world. We think of the world in Africa and India where they're struggling to find supplies of medical supplies to cope with COVID. And so we pray that there will be an adequate supply of oxygen and of vaccines. We pray for the rollout of the vaccines across the world I pray, Lord, above all, that you will be victorious over the forces of disease and destruction. We thank you that all power and authority is given unto Jesus. We thank you for the work of Christian aid and especially the work that it does to help communities to have a sustainable future. So we pray for the blessing upon Christian aid this year, that as people remember it throughout the land, that the fruits of that may, may change and help the lives of many people. Lord, we remember those nearer home who are troubled, sick or injured. Hear us as we ask and bring before you those who are the victims of violence. We pray for those who are experiencing distress. For those who are coping with illness. And especially, we remember before you Kathleen MacDonald, Maureen Rivers and Margaret MacDonald. We continue to remember those who are in care homes, remembering before you Mary McPherson, Christina Hunter, 
Moira McLeod, Pat Kane, Brenda Spence, Joanne Grant, Jesse Craig, Isabel MacDonald, James Scott, John Dare, May they all know your hand of blessing, protection and strength. We pray, Lord, for the church in Scotland, that we may rise up to your calling to take the gospel of salvation out into the world. We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon every person who is here. Grant, Lord, that we may not leave this place without receiving a personal blessing from you. And we pray it too for those who are sharing from afar, from at home. And so, Lord, we sum up our prayer in the words which Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. So um, Marion's not with me today because she's sharing the message at, through the Zoom service for um, St Mundus and Durer, God willing. So God willing she'll be joining us next Sunday. But now we turn to the third hymn that's on our sheet and here we'll read the words of the, the first two verses that are printed there. Send the gospel of salvation to a world of dying men. Tell it out to every nation till the Lord shall come again. Go and tell them, go and tell them, Jesus died for sinful men. Go and tell them, go and tell them, he is coming, he is coming, he is coming back again. Tis the church's great commission this the Master's last command. Christ has died for every creature. Tell it out in every land. Go and tell them, go and tell them, Christ died for sinful men. Go and tell them, go and tell them, He is coming, He is coming, He is coming back again.
Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and with all whom you love, both now and for evermore. Amen. <laughs>